The Roman Empire was held together through a road system that enabled her military to move rapidly across Europe and the Near East, and any rebellion in the furthest reaches of the empire could realistically expect to see a legion on the horizon in only a few weeks. These legions did not march unprotected, though. Whether in the empire or in hostile territory, each night the army would halt and the soldiers would unsling their shovels, picks, axes, and other construction instruments, and as one body erect a fortification for the evening. This fortification, which the Romans called a castrum, is where the English term castle comes from. The castrum came in many forms, with a quick field fort being comprised of earth and timber, while a need for a more permanent presence dictated the use of stone and brick. In this video, we'll take a look at just how exactly these structures were built and organized. The average legion of the High Empire would march something like five hours a day, and when the time for marching was drawn to a close, the legate would dispatch the legion's corps of engineers ahead of the army to find a suitable location for building their overnight quarters. Typically, the engineers would look for a place that gave a decent vantage point and a command of the surrounding landscape, usually taking the form of some kind of a hill. A source of water was a must for choosing the site, and engineers would look for a stream or river or lake, anything that contained water, nearby. Once that was selected, the engineers would dig out the defensive trench, called a fossa in Latin, and then erect an auger, or rampart, made from the excavated earth. By the time this was finished, the rest of the legion would have arrived, and the soldiers would have divided up based upon their cohort, and then subdivided into their centuries, and then each contubernium would set up their tent. The total number of tents fluctuated based upon the size of the legion, and could number anywhere from 450 to about 600. After the tents were set up, the legion soldiers took their axes and headed to the nearest forest to gather wood, not only for fires, but for the construction of a palisade that would be erected atop the earthen rampart. This palisade would not be a solid construction of nailed boards, though. It resembled more closely a series of sharpened stakes. Additionally, some stakes would be hammered into the descending portion of the rampart to prevent enemies from scaling should they actually manage to cross the trench. Now, within the actual fort itself, the layout was based around a grid pattern, with the exception being the actual outline of the walls, as these were designed in the shape of a playing card, with the corners rounded and the sides straight. There were four entrances, each of which was protected by towers. Sometimes they would have gates, but not always. There was also a road system laid out within the castrum. Well, I say road system, but really it was a pathway, since they weren't constructed of stone unless it was designed to be a permanent, long-lasting structure. Every Roman castrum had a main street, or central path if the camp was temporary, called the Via Principalis. Technically speaking, the Via Principalis went from one end of the camp to the other without being blocked by anything since it continued through the Great Hall, but we'll get to that building in a minute. The center of the fort functioned as a forum, like the one you'd find in any town constructed by the Romans. Situated in the forum was the Praetorium, the central command HQ, where the upper-level officers of the Legion lived. While functioning as a non-permanent structure, the Praetorium was usually just a larger tent, similar to the one that the average rank-and-file soldier would be housed in. However, when the need for a permanent military force arose, such as along Hadrian's Wall, the Praetorium was constructed of brick and stone, and served as a multi-room structure with each room having its own specific functions and offices. If need be, it could also function as a court for non-Roman citizens. Next to the Praetorium was the Quaestorium, where the Castrum supply officer was stationed. Accordingly, the Horium, or warehouse, was positioned next to that building. A minute ago I mentioned that the Via Principalis would travel through the Great Hall. The Great Hall, which functioned as a mess, and the adjacent bathhouse were only present if the castrum was designed to be permanent. It was here that soldiers took their meals, bathed, relaxed, and sought medical treatment. Otherwise, if the structure was not permanent, the soldiers would just cook their meals around campfires at night. Of course, after this, you had the tents where the soldiers would live. Although, if it was meant to be a permanent residence, those tents would eventually be turned into structures of stone and brick. All of the empty space in the camp was taken up by a system of roads, or at least pathways. Around the edge of the fort, inside the walls, was the Via Sagularis, which served not so much as a way around the castrum, so much as a barrier between the wall 
in the buildings to catch enemy missiles. Everything else typically would be either just earth, or if the camp was meant to be long term, brick and stone. There was one other road system though called the Via Praetoria, so named because usually the Praetorium was situated on it, although not in this example because the castro my model by animation John is Iconiacum. Going off that point, I should mention that while Castra attempted to look the same, there was a degree of variation that was to be had based upon the terrain and the availability of resources. And, on that note, our tour of the Roman castrum and how it was constructed is concluded.